Yes, yeah, so I'm the legal director of NCPCF, and I first got involved in this stuff back in 2004. I'm a criminal defense attorney in Albany, New York, and in 2004, a man named Yasin Arif, that's not what, um, anyway, he was, um, he was arrested oh, along with the co-defendant, um, and he was the imam of a small inner city mosque in Albany, New York, Yasin. He was a, a refugee from Iraq, a Kurdish refugee who had fled Saddam Hussein um, and um, was targeted by the FBI after 9-11 based on mistaken identity, we found out years later, like many of the people at Guantanamo. And he was, um, basically they tried to entrap him in a sting operation using this really slimy, manipulative informant who didn't even explain anything that was going on and all Yassin was doing was witnessing a loan from the informant to his co-defendant, Mohammed Hussein, who just needed money to fix up his apartments. He was trying to run a pizza place and some apartments in the inner city and it wasn't going too well. He needed money, so he accepted this loan, but he had no idea it had anything to do with terrorism. And um, the FBI had this really complicated plot and they were supposed to, the informant was supposed to explain it to these guys, but he didn't. And so usually in sting operations, the targets will say things, bad things on tape, and that's what gets played for the jury. And here, that didn't happen. They never said anything showing that they even understood anything illegal was going on, but just the words of the informant were used. And Yassin, and he, all he cared about was the he was witnessing this loan and when was it going to be repaid. He wasn't listening to all this crazy stuff that the informant was saying that didn't, he didn't think it had anything to do with this. So anyway, but so there were so many unfair things about this case. I don't have time to go into it all, but um, I'm part of Project Salam's doing a podcast where we're going a deep dive into the case on terrortalk.org if you want to check it out. But um, so what, just one of the things that was a big part of the case was secret evidence. Um, one of the first things that happened was the government came in after Yassin was arrested and say he need, said he, he shouldn't get out on bond. He needs to be locked up um, before trial, until trial, because he's a terrorist commander. We found this notebook in, in a camp in Iraq that we bombed. Military intelligence translated it, and it, it, showed, it says Kak Yassin, and it means terrorist commander in Arabic. So we said, uh, give us this page, and we'll get the translation checked out. And, well, they didn't say Kak Yassin at that point, they just said it means terrorist commander. So the judge said, yeah, give them the page. So before we even got a copy of the page, the government wrote a letter and said, oh, so we made a mistake. Military intelligence made a mistake. It doesn't really mean commander. It's not even in, in the Arabic language. It's the Kurdish language. It means brother or mister. It's a term of respect. It's kind of the most common word in the Kurdish Sarani dialect. And oops, so he got out on bond for a while until they came up with some more crazy stuff based on his poetry, and it's a long, involved story. But basically, based after we got that page and showed that they were lying, um, the government invoked the Classified Information Procedures Act, and we never got to see any of the other evidence that the government was providing to the judge, right? Sixth Amendment says you get to confront the evidence against you. But under SEPA, the standard is the defense attorney, even if they have a security clearance, I didn't get a security clearance, my boss at the time got a security clearance just to see this evidence. They built a special room for him at the courthouse and then they proceeded to not give him any of the evidence because the standard is the evidence in the mind of the government or the judge has to be favorable to the defense. So if they had given a secret document saying Yassin is a terrorist commander, that is not favorable to the defense. And we would never would have gotten that if that had been under SEPA. And he would have been locked up pretrial and everybody would have thought he was a terrorist commander. But, so that's what happened after they invoked SEPA. The judge, not the jury, but the judge got to see all this evidence that we found out years later was based on false identity. They thought he was somebody else at some point in time. And um, so the judge was very, very biased against Yassin. And what, how that affected the trial, one of the ways it affected the trial was the judge told the jury that the FBI had good and valid reasons for targeting Yassin, but they didn't need to worry about it. So the jury's looking at, there's no evidence that he's doing anything in the sting operation. 
He doesn't say anything, he doesn't do anything, but the FBI has good and valid reasons, and he's a Muslim, and he's got a beard, and he's from Iraq, and we're at war with Iraq, and they acquitted him of most of the counts, but then they were afraid to acquit him altogether, even though there was nothing different about what they did convict him of. It was just a different conversation where no new information was given him. So they, they convicted him of a couple of counts. His co-defendant, um, who just wanted the money but didn't want to support terrorism, and the judge even said Muhammad doesn't want to support terrorism, he got convicted of all the counts. They both got sentenced to 15 years, and um, their Yassin's going to get out next year. His co-defendant has another year because he was locked up later. But anyway, um, their um, Yassin's doing pretty well, but his wife's had a really hard time all these years. Um, and his kids are doing well. Um, but it's just, it opened my eyes to the abuses that were going on. I mean, I, was, I already knew some stuff, but I had no idea what the secret evidence and the material support for terrorism laws and the sting operations. Um, so after that, um, some of my friends, we got together and we formed Project Salam because we had been supporting Yassin um, during this case. And we formed a group called Project Salam where we started looking at other cases. And then um, how we met um, Samuel Aryan is a good story and how we formed National Coalition because um, Yassin, while he was in jail after, after trial, um, he wrote a book about his life called Son of Mountains, and you can find it. It's really, it's really an interesting book about his life growing up as a Kurd in the mountains and in northern Iraq and dealing with Saddam Hussein and everything else that happened. And um, anyway, he wrote this book, and my colleague Steve Downs um, wrote a foreword or an afterword to it called Profile of a Frame Up about the case. And we sent that book to Al Jazeera. And we didn't know anybody there, but we sent it to Al Jazeera, and it ended up in the possession of Leila Al Arian, who um, was working for Al Jazeera at the time. And so it was in her house, where her dad ended up under house arrest. So you know, he had time. He looked at it. He read it. He said, "Hey, I want to talk to these people." So his his son came up to Albany, New York, to the first conference of the United Anti-War National Anti-War Coalition in the summer of 2010, and introduced himself to us and said, my dad wants to meet you, but you got to come down to DC because he's under house arrest. And we said, okay. <laughs> so, and Mel was there, and I don't know if you were there, but Layla, I think. And anyway, so we had this meeting with a bunch of other people, and we formed the National Coalition in late 2010. Um, and one of the things I did as, as legal director, along with a bunch of other people, was we made a database of all these cases, and we started really studying them. And one of the um, sort of data sets, the main data set that we used was um, the Department of Justice um, had come out with a list of 399 cases uh, like in 2011. And there were cases between 2001 and 2010 that the government claimed were domestic terrorism cases. And Yassine's name was on there and a bunch of other names that we knew were, were innocent people were on there. And so we thought, well, we better really look at this list. And we looked at every single case on that list. And, and we had, at this point, realized that many of these cases were preemptive prosecution, which is a model that the government was developing mainly after 9-11, um, where they would go after people not based on any crime that the people had committed, but based on a fear that maybe in the future these people might take action against the US based on whatever the government thought their beliefs were. And it was basically all Muslims that they were going after um, in this way. And we studied all these 399 cases and we found out that 74% um, of them were purely preemptive prosecution um, where the targets didn't do any kind of crime at all were either entrapped in a sting operation or um, charged in these ridiculous material support or conspiracy charges where it's either based on protect what should be free speech or association, things that should be constitutionally protected. Um, and then 92% of the cases had what we call elements of preemptive prosecution where maybe there was some low level crime, fraud crime or drug crime going on but the government because it was Muslims, kind of treated it as a terrorism case 
and put this aura of terrorism on it, sentenced the people more harshly, and maybe used secret evidence and things like that. And so we looked at um, the kind of tactics that the government uses to do this to people, and um, they were all involved in Yassin's case, the, the three main tactics, well, more of them too, but I don't have time to go into all of them, but secret evidence being a big one that is used in a lot of these cases where the judge gets biased against the defendant and various other things happen that, that are detrimental to the defense by, like, you don't get to see the evidence against you. Even if your attorney has a security clearance, the attorney can't show it to the client. If they, if they do get to see it, if it's going to be used in the trial, if it's not going to be used in the trial, the judge still gets to see it, and the defense attorney doesn't even get to see it, and it's really a huge problem. Um, also, sting operations um, that target vulnerable people, like um, the Newberg Four um, that Mel mentioned. These were um, for, yeah, um, kind of down and out guys in Newburgh, New York, that had been in jail um, before and were sort of Muslim, but they weren't very knowledgeable about Islam. And um, the, the FBI sent um, the same informant that was used in our case, Shahed Hussain, and he's still in Saratoga, New York, and we're running a motel. Um, but they sent him down to Newburgh to troll this mosque for a year and look for targets, which the FBI says they don't do. They say they, they don't go in with no target in mind. Well, they do, and they did in this case, and it came out um, that they did that. And, um, but they couldn't find any targets because there was nobody there doing anything to do with terrorism. And so he just hung around. Then finally, he, he annoyed people so much they kicked him out of the mosque. So he was hanging around the parking lot. And that's where he met this guy, James Cromedy, who was a con artist. And they were basically trying to con each other. Um, Shahed is saying, is like, oh, I'm this really rich guy. I'm Muslim. I can help you out, my Muslim brother. I got all these cars. I can help you out. Do you want to work with me? And you know, um, and like commit jihad and stuff. And um, James was like, Yeah, sure. Oh, I'm a really bad jihadist. I do all this bad <laughs> stuff. And he's it's like it's all fake. Like he's never he just made up all this stuff trying to get like money from Shahad Hussein, who was driving flashy cars and wearing all this fancy clothes and jewelry and stuff. And so they're trying to con each other. And this went on for a long time, and then finally James got sick of it, and he disappeared like he stopped responding to Shahed Hussain, who called himself Maksud in that case. And then finally Maksud gets him on the phone and goes, hey brother, I promised you $250,000, you don't want it? And James is like, oh yeah, I'm in, $250,000. He doesn't even have a driver's license or a nickel to his name. Um, and so it goes along and they do this fake plot where they're going to blow up a plane at Stewart's Air Force Base and they're going to attack a synagogue in um, uh, was Riverdale. And, um, but it's all coming from the government, the FBI and the informant. And James has nothing, you know, he's, he adds nothing to it except he's saying, yeah, sure, I'll take the money. Um, and then he finally gets three other guys and offers them $5,000 each at the last minute to join this plot, which, and they couldn't even, like, look for a map of the target or anything, they didn't know how to do it. The um, the FBI had to do every single piece of this, and but they were going to push these buttons on cell phones at the end and supposedly blow these things up. But actually, the, the so-called bomb wasn't connected properly. Was that because they didn't know how to do it, or because they really didn't want to do it, and they were just trying to con the money out of this guy? Who knows? But nothing was going to blow up, even if it had been real, because it wasn't connected. Right? But then the FBI swooped in with tanks and helicopters and just like this crazy show and arrested them. And um, they went to trial and they argued entrapment. And certainly in James' case, like what happened with him where he backed out until he was offered $250,000, that's, that's the definition of entrapment, I would think. But the, there's a, the jury was told that there's no entrapment unless the target backs out of the plot before they get arrested. So that means there's no entrapment defense, basically. Because if they back out, they're not going to be arrested anyway, probably. Or, anyway, that there's basically no entrapment defense under that standard, and it's never succeeded in any post-9-11 so-called Muslim terrorism case um, for that reason. 
and also the, just the fear that in, these kind of things induce. So um, a lot of times people are, are targeted because they have mental illness or they're just kind of slow mentally or they're easily manipulated in some way. Um, and there's a lot of cases like that, especially like with people supporting ISIS. Sometimes people will be like really upset about what's being done by the U.S. in Muslim lands and want to do something and be, you know, thinking, well, what should I do? Should I maybe join ISIS or maybe not join ISIS? And then instead of a kind of intervention where they'll be talked out of it, uh, the government will tuck them into it. And people will either tuck them in, yeah, you want to go and fight, or no, maybe you don't want to go and fight. Maybe you want to you want to do an attack here. And that, that's, of course, a most serious charge, just the idea of talking about it. Then they can get charged with conspiracy to commit murder instead of just a material support charge. So there's um, a lot of these cases now. And um, the material support um, that Mel talked about with um, the Holy Land case, that, um, that law was actually, the material support law was actually passed in 1996 under Clinton as part of the Anti-Terrorism Act, but it wasn't really used hardly until after 9-11. And um, when it was first passed, there was a group called the Humanitarian Law Project back in the late 90s that worked with groups like the Tamil Tigers at the time and the PKK, the Turkish Kurds that were both of those groups were on a designated terrorism list by the U.S. State Department, so the material support law made it illegal to have any connection with them, any support for them, even if it's totally nonviolent. So what this humanitarian law project was trying to do was to work with these groups to resolve their differences peacefully, and so they sued, saying we can't do our work under this law because you're criminalizing this work by making it illegal for us to, to work with them at all. And the case wound through the courts from like for t over 10 years, from like 1998 to 2010. Finally in 2010, the Supreme Court said, you can't do that kind of work. You can't have any connection with a group that's on the designated terrorism list. If you write an op-ed saying they, you know, if you, if you ever have any connection with them and you represent them as a lawyer or you write a letter saying they have legitimate grievances in some way and there should be a peaceful negotiation. Anything like that is material support to terrorism under the, the law, and that's what the Supreme Court said. And, and um, so that that's what they used against the Holy Land Foundation, and even though the Holy Land Foundation, it was even crazier because they didn't actually give any money to a designated terrorist organization. They gave the money to the Sakat committees in Gaza which was the same groups that the International Red Cross and USAID gave money to, but because they were Muslim and they were a Muslim charity that the government was trying to go after anyway, they said, oh yeah, but Hamas was involved with those Sakat committees, and so because you guys wanted to support Hamas, you're, you're guilty of material support. And it took um, two trials, the first trial was a mistrial, the second trial they got convicted, and two of them got sentenced to 65 years. Um, Should I get Lena? Okay. All right, so yeah, I think um, I just want to say one more thing about we, we published um, a report called Inventing Terrorists in 2014 because I started to talk about how we analyzed the, the 400 cases and you know the, the, the breakdown of preemptive prosecution cases and it, this is all um, in our report and it, it's kind of relevant now with the Trump travel ban which is now going to the Supreme Court where they have, part of that is to come up with a list of cases and say that that um, Muslims who came here were involved in terrorism cases. And some of those are on our list and you can, you know, if you look at our report, you can see that they're not real terrorism cases for the most part. All right, so, all right. Uh, I'll wrap it up there and have Lena, Valerian come up.